Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them. And he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I was working on this sermon this week. And normally when I preach, I like to have an outline. And I like to have everything in my head exactly the way I'm going to go through it. I may not know the exact words. Occasionally I'll read, but I, I think it's more interesting if somebody just sort of stands up and talks to you. I couldn't do it. I can't do it on this one. So I have a jumble of notes, and I just said, okay, Holy Spirit, on this Trinity Sunday, I'm going to need some help. And, of course, I talked to Marta about the sermon because we talk about this stuff every week. And I said, you know, it's Trinity Sunday, but this is really about the Holy Spirit. And I'm having a tough time because I like to get into my head. And this is really more of Mother Marta's wheelhouse, this sermon. She could preach it like that. And so she starts to tell me all this stuff. And God, the divine wind and the Ruach, the Spirit and dwelling within us. And I'm like, no, I, I get it. But I mean, how are you supposed to tell people about the Holy Spirit? How, are you, how am I supposed to make this into a sermon? What are people going to say when they walk out the back of the church and say, wow, I really got something interesting out of that. And this is what I'm taking away. And I really struggled with it. And I realized one of the reasons why I struggled with it here as I look at my jumbled up notes. Um, is because I, I was trying to describe something that is indescribable. How do you describe to someone the Holy Spirit? It's like trying to describe, uh, Kate said, Mount Everest. You've ever been to Mount Everest? How do you describe Mount Everest to someone? How do you describe what chocolate cake tastes like? How do you describe what falling in love feels like? You can't really describe it, the Holy Spirit. And I remember seeing a sermon one time, and the minister said something to the congregation. He said, you either get it or you don't. And I thought, that's awful. That's an awful thing to say to people. But I think as I've gotten older now, uh, uh, it's true. We either get it or we don't. You get what chocolate cake tastes like. You get what falling in love gets, feels like. And you've experienced the Holy Spirit in your life, or if you haven't, you don't know what it's all about. And what are some of the things that can keep us from feeling the Holy Spirit? I think this text, this Genesis text, what did you get from it? If you were, if you were in chaos, in a camp in Babylon, and you were losing your identity as an individual and as a nation, what would you maybe get from this? To me, it is God bringing order from chaos. When God created in the beginning, the earth was a formless void, and there was water. And if, in Jewish history, water, you saw, you heard about all the deep sea creatures and the monsters and things like that. Water represents chaos. What does Jesus do when he comes back and everything is chaos, the wind and the waves? Jesus walks on the water. God brings order out of chaos. And in your life now, or in your life, you've probably experienced times when it's chaos, haven't you? Nothing is settled. Things aren't working the way they're supposed to. We live in the past or we live in the, in the future. Whether it's 10 minutes in the past or 10 years in the future, our minds are a churning wheel, a cog that never seems to end. And it's what keeps us from noticing the Holy Spirit all around us. When I was in Washington, D.C., I was getting ready to deploy to Afghanistan, and I was, I had my daughter, Lucy, living with me, who was 18, who was learning how to drink alcohol, 
and my son coming up to visit all the time. I lived in a pretty nice neighborhood in McLean, Virginia, close to CIA headquarters. It was a bunch of older, wealthy people. I lived in a townhouse. I'm being shuttled around from Intel Community Building to Intel Community Building, being briefed, getting ready to go. I'm going into work and trying to pretend that things are normal. Meanwhile, Lucy is failing out of school. Uh, she's, have, she's throwing these huge parties every time I leave town, and I have to travel all the time, such that my neighbor one day came to me and said, Charlie, what, what, what is going on? And I was like, what? He said, the police were here. When you were out of town, the police were here. And I went in the house, and I'm like, the place is immaculate. And then I went over to the windows. I didn't have curtains in the downstairs. And I noticed there were little pieces of tape around the windows where they had taped up sheets to have the party. And I later found out there's like 200 people in this 2,000 square foot townhouse in McLean, Virginia. And I was going to work trying to pretend that my life was in absolute chaos. And finally, finally, I just had to put it down. I just said, I can't do it. I got to quit pretending that this is not happening. And I went and talked to my boss, and I just said, hey, things are out of control. I need some time off. And I finally breathed. And it was one of the experiences that I had. If you've never had this, I was sitting outside of, on my doorstep, and there's a little park right across in our little community. And I was in a panic one second, and this bird went tweet, 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 and flew by. And all of a sudden, I was a different human being. I don't know what you call it, I call it the Holy Spirit. And my outlook on life changed dramatically. I was digging a hole the other day here in Idaho in the Treasure Valley. And you can take post hole diggers and start digging a hole, right? I don't know how you farmers did it because I would go completely insane. A rock this size or a rock about the size of a quarter make the same report when you hit it with a post hole there, right? I mean, you don't know how big the rock is going to be. And I've just got my little garden in the back, you know? I mean, I'm, pl I'm planting a little pear tree, you know, the things this tall. And I start digging, and this is what I get. <laughs> now, you, you have bigger ones than this. I got it. But, I mean, honestly, really? <laughs> I would imagine this weighs close to 30 pounds. It took me an hour and a half to get this up. <laughs> because you know how it, you know, the soil is hard, but it's also kind of moist. And so you're trying to get your shovel around. I broke one shovel. If you're like me, we walk around in the place. We walk around. Sorry, I'm going to come into your area or cause anxiety. But I have people come into my office, and I've had it for years, carrying a bag full of these. They're emotional rocks, and it's okay. You don't want to ignore the rocks. They're there. We need to talk about them. But at the end, I'm not going to throw this because I break my foot. I'm klutzy. But in the end, we can go through these rocks that cause us to miss the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Or we can say, I've, I've looked at this. I've processed this. There's nothing I can do about this. And I'm going to set it down. And I'm going to leave it. It's then that we're ready to receive the Holy Spirit. I want to play a video for you by a guy named Rob Bell about exactly this the breath of God. Each day, we take about 26,000 breaths, which is somewhere around 14,000 liters of air 
right? And we should breathe from our stomach, not our chest. But when we're distracted, when we're stressed, when we're moving too fast, we tend to breathe from our chest. We take somewhere between four and six breaths a minute, but, but most of us on average take between 16 and 20 breaths a minute. And experts say that from our breathing, we should get 99% of our energy. And they say that most of us only access 10 to 20% of that energy. I mean, with all that all of us have going on every day, I mean, who actually thinks about their breathing? Now, there's a story about a shepherd named Moses who's living in the land called Midian. And God appears to him, speaking to him through a burning bush. And God says, Moses, take off your sandals because the ground that you're standing on is holy. I mean, now, Moses has been walking this land for 40 years. I mean, it isn't as if the ground all of a sudden became holy. The ground didn't just change. It's that, it's that Moses becomes aware of it, which raises the question for us. Are we standing on holy ground all the time, passing burning bushes on the left and the right? And because we're moving too fast and we're distracted, we miss that. Now God has heard the cry of his people who are in slavery in Egypt, and he wants Moses to go rescue them. And Moses says, well, well, if I go to these people and I say to them that God wants to liberate them, they're going to say to me, well, what is this God's name? So Moses says to God, what is your name? And God responds, Moses, you tell them, the Lord sent you. Now this name, Lord, if you're reading it in an English translation of the Bible, the name is spelled capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The name appears in the Bible over 6,000 times. But, but it wasn't originally written in the English language. It was written in the Hebrew language. And in Hebrew, the name is essentially four letters. Uh, we, we would say Y-H-V-H. But in Hebrew, the letters are pronounced Yod, He, Va, He. Now, some pronounce the name Yahweh or Yahweh, although in many traditions, the name isn't even pronounced because it's considered so sacred, so mysterious, so holy. In fact, the ancient rabbis believed that these letters were actually, they function kind of as vowels in the Hebrew language. They, they believed that they were essentially kind of breathing sounds and that Ultimately, the name is simply unpronounceable because the letters together are essentially the sound of breathing. Yo, hey, va, hey. Is, is the name of God the sound of breathing? Now, the book of Genesis says that when God created the first person, God took this dust, this dirt from the ground, and God shaped it, formed it, and then breathed into it, and it became a living being. Now, the Hebrew word for ground is the word Adama, and this first person, his name is Adam. And, and so essentially, it's from Adama, we get Adam. We pronounce the name Adam. From ground, we get ground man. From the dirt, we get dirt man. There's, there's this paradox at the heart of what it means to be a human being. We're, we're fragile and vulnerable. We come from the dust. As it says in Ecclesiastes, all people come from the dust. As it's written in the Psalms, all come from the dust and then die and return to the dust.
And so the other day, I'm uh, trying to call someone, so I dial the number on my phone, and the call won't connect, and so I dial the number again, and it still won't connect, and then my phone tells me I need to redial, and I'm getting more and more frustrated, and I catch myself literally about to throw my phone out the window. I mean, why is it that the strangest things can get under our skin so quickly? I mean, do you ever have moments when, when you feel like you're seconds from losing it? We come from the dust. We're fragile. Like it's written in the Psalms, each person's life is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Have you ever walked the halls of a hospital? Have you ever stood over a casket? If you've ever driven by a bad car accident, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Life is fragile. And yet at the same time, you've been breathed into by the creator of the universe. And this, this divine breath is in every single human being ever. Like it's written in the Psalms, Psalm 8 says that God has crowned us with glory and honor. Now the glory and honor in this passage isn't referring to God, it's referring to the people God has made. We're, we're these sacred divine dirt clods, and yet we possess untold power and strength. Your life is but a breath, and yet you were made by the creator of everything. Now, for thousands of years, people have understood that this physical breath that we all possess is actually a picture of a deeper reality. In the Bible, the word for breath is the same word as the word for spirit. In the Hebrew language, it's the word ruach. And in the Greek language, it's the word pneuma. Like one scripture says that when God takes away the ruach, the breath of all living creatures, then they die and return to the dust. But when God sends the ruach, the spirit, they are created. Breath, spirit, same word. And the first Christians took hold of this idea, then they took it way farther. They actually believed that the Spirit of God resides or can literally dwell, live in a person. One scripture in Romans 8 says that if the pneuma, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, is living in you, then God will give you life. Another scripture says that what the Spirit of God does living in you is it sanctifies. Now the word sanctify, it means to, means to like purge or to clean out. What it essentially means is that when you let God in, when you breathe, what happens is you become aware of all the things you need to leave behind, everything you need to let go of. If you are totally honest right now about what's going on inside of you, what would we find out? What would you say if you just kind of opened it up? What's inside? What are you angry about? What are you concerned for? What are you anxious for? What's bothering you? I mean, what's filling up your headspace? What's stressing you? I mean, if we were to be totally honest about what's going on inside of you, is there anything you need right now to breathe out. Jesus said that what the Spirit of God does is the Spirit guides us into truth. Is there anything you need guidance in? I mean, maybe what we need is as close as breathing. Another scripture says that God gives the Spirit without limit. Is there anything right now you need to breathe as it says in Ephesians chapter 4, there's one God and Father of all who's over all and through all and in all. As it says in Hebrews chapter 2, there's God for whom and through whom everything exists. Or, or as Jesus said it, God is spirit. And you are a sacred creation of God. The divine breath is flowing through you, and it's flowing through the person next to you, and it's flowing through the person next to them. You are on holy ground, and there is a holiness to 
the people around us and, and how you treat them. Jesus said that whatever, whatever you do for them, you've done for him. God is there because God is here. And, and, and our person, a person doesn't have to agree with this for it to already be true. God has already given us life and the breath we just took and the breath we took before that and the breath we're going to take and the breath after that. When a baby is born, what's the first thing it must do or this baby isn't going to make it? Does this baby have to take a breath or say the name of God? And what's the last thing you do and, and then you die? We, the last thing we do is we take our last breath? Or is it that when we can no longer say the name of God, we die? I mean, is it possible that you could be having a meal with a good friend of yours who, who, who doesn't believe in God? And you could be sitting across from the table from your friend who is saying, There is no God. And, and what you would be hearing is, Yo, hey. May you come to see that God is here, right now, with us all the time. May you come to see that the ground that you are standing on is holy. And as you slow down, may you become aware that it's in you, hey, Father, hey, that we live. Spirit that is already inside of each one of us.